Evening, and thank you. Now, it's when you've been on television as long as I have that you begin to realise what a twitching heap you are. I mean, when you watch a recording of a show is when you begin to understand the mannerisms that you possess. For instance, whenever people impersonate me, they do this or they do that. Now, that's either a nervous gesture or it means something. And on my show tonight, I've got a man who believes that gestures mean everything. He's an expert on what's called non-verbal communication, better known as body language, and he is Dr. Joe Brasich. Also on the show, someone else who's an expert communicator, someone who's articulated with eloquence and passion the problems of the Aborigine in Australian society. And she is Miss Faith Bandler. Another of my guests will be an ideal subject for the aforesaid Dr. Brasich. His stage act is a display of body language designed to entertain and amuse, and he's the one and only Mr. Peter Allen. But back to what's known as body language. Simply put, it's what we reveal of ourselves by mannerism, look, or gesture. With some people, it's simply an academic exercise. To my guest, it's a practical business, which is applied throughout the world to various bodies of people, from policemen to football teams to businessmen. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Joe Bracey. <laughs> First of all, what is body language? Well, uh, Mike, I think um, body language, to explain it simply, I call it the art of seeing what others are thinking. It's the non-verbal behaviour that people give through empathy and through emotion, rather than the carefully planned word. And so I believe that all people give body language. It's more accurate than the carefully ch uh, chosen Well, a lot of people, of course, Joe, would say it was a, it was a gimmick, uh, I... rather than a science. Yeah, I think so. I think a lot of people would call it a gimmick, but then again, all new sciences commence as gimmicks until there's a body of research which is pulled together and people start to see the generalisations and then you find, gee, that happens every time. Mm. I'm basically a sociologist and through the studies we've done, we've found that in certain situations, certain recurrent um, gestures occur when people are in certain frames of mind. And so it's a little bit beyond a gimmick. It's getting to be quite scientific. Well, where did it start? I mean, who was the first body linguist? Oh, I think um, in modern times, the uh, Englishman Bird Whistle, uh, it's a humorous name for a guy to be in body language, but he was one of the first ones. But I think it went back, and the, the first one, I think, was it took uh, in Germany. There was a guy who had a horse, and a horse was supposedly being able to tap the answers to sums and things by with his hoof on the ground. And in fact, they discovered that the horse, after they put up a sum four plus three, the horse would start tapping, and it was sensing the, um, the audience reaction. And when the audience got up to seven, the horse would stop. And then that, so that particular guy perhaps got started into the area that there must be this en extra sensory perception. But it's not, it's just an observation. But no one person, I think, Michael, is, is a body linguist. There's several in the United States, E.T. Hall, Bird Whistle. Yeah, Morris. but what a, I mean, I made the point there in the introduction that one of the things that happens to you when you go on television yeah. and watch yourself back, yeah. and also impersonators watch you back, yeah. is that you pick up little mannerisms, gestures that you have. Yeah. Um, now, you've been interviewed many times on television. I guess, yeah. yeah. What, I mean, now, now, tell me how I display myself in body language. Well, I, I've been watching you actually there, Michael. You're a cool cat, as they say. Very cool. And uh, people have asked me about various uh, entertainers. You go over very well, and I believe that you're a successful man in your field, and that's uh, well known. But I think that your body language, which I believe, and a lot of people like me believe, 70% of your interviewing is body language. For instance, uh, when you came out, your coat was done up, and now it's uh, undone. We've got to the stage now, you've turned your shoulders, and they're not square, as some people would have it. You've crossed the outside leg out there, your hands are extended, your head's gone to the side, and you're displaying to me genuine interest. Now, whether you're saying it or not, I think, well, here's a guy I can relate to. And so you're, you go over very, very well. And I think if the uh, occasion arose where you didn't like it, I think perhaps if you're not very careful, you would tend to go back and, and give some of the, the less studied signs. Well, what would they be then? What are they just... <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's absolutely... <laughs> I mean, see, what does that mean? <laughs> okay, I, I think we get to that stage there, Michael. I can't see. It was at the eyes. It could be I can't see it. The nose one that you're tending to do now could be. Now, where do I go now? What am I doing next? That's <laughs> true. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, what are the what, what are therefore they, then the mind then will be a, 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 a motion towards somebody, a welcoming yes, posture. Yes. Then what would be the, the signs of a defensive posture in any way? Oh, that's, uh, I think you see it many times. A person will come in there and invariably he'll have the, uh, the coat done up and he'll uh, extend the legs, the heels will go to the floor, the, 
arms will go down, the head will go down, and it'll be, you know, I like it here, you know, like heck I do. You know? What are they going to do with me next? And, and so you'll find that this will be the defensive one, and as people become interested, their, their head comes up, and then you'll find that their knees will start coming apart. And in fact, they might just kind of sit, see, a few people are changing there now already, but they're saying, they're saying, oh yes, but they're still defensive, and then the head goes to the side. And then from the head to the side, the hand goes up there, and see, and then we find people, they already put their hands down in the audience there, they thought, I've caught me out. But as people become interested, you'll find they'll do that, then they'll, their feet will come actually flat on the floor, like yours have, and you'll tend to lean forward and your head's to the side. Now we've got a running proposition. You can do nothing with a person like that. That's, up, that's uptight. Well, let's have a look at some, uh, some clips, which in fact you have seen. Yes. We, we selected some scenes from, uh, from, from the show, which indicate about myself and, and a guest of mine, um, sort of certain things. Now, first of all, we'll look at, at Don Dunstan, who I interviewed uh, recently. And I asked Don Dunstan a question um, about wearing, him wearing um, pink hot pants <laughs> I in, wondered what in, you asked in, him. <laughs> in Parliament. Now, this is his response. I want you to tell me what it means. <laughs> now, <laughs> now, freeze well, it there. What did that mean? Well, I think that's a classic. I think you could see, he could hardly believe that you would ask such a dumb question. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that's what he was thinking. <laughs> dumb question at all. And it was kind of one of these belying sorts of things. And he went back with his head. And that is a classic, you know, I can't believe it. Uh, you must be exaggerating to ask me that. Right. And it's done like that or like that. So virtually, he's, it's a little bit of disbelief at your, you must be, uh, kind of, why would you ask such a question? Right. You could well, be let's, lying. Let's move point. on then. Now, we've got, we've got one or two sequences of myself here. I, I've not seen these, actually. Yeah, what's that mean? I think that's a classic one that people get, and I think looking around the audience, we can see it all. So it's one of those mic of interest. It becomes interest, and then it becomes a little more. It goes up like that. It becomes critical evaluation. But I think somebody said something. I'd like to see the actual interplay, but that's interest. You're Let's in see the next one. Critical Going interest. <laughs> Well, Michael, um, it goes like this. Well, according to all theory, anyway, is you're saying, I don't like it much. Where the hell do I go from here? Oh, <laughs> I, I, do, I, I do a lot of that, a lot of that. Let's have a look at the next one. I've not seen these, actually. Oh, my God. That's the flicking of the hair. Th that could be an interesting one. If there was a young, beautiful young lady there, you're probably preening and saying to you, I mean, she's not bad as it is, but, uh, and it's, you know, the girls do that. The guys tend to do that. I would like to see who you, who you were working with. Don Dunstan. Let's <laughs> <laughs> have a look at the next one. <laughs> Uh, I'd say that was when you were completing a show. You'd, I, I would say that yeah. you're just finished with so someone and then. you're recomposing and here we are again, boys. Uh, this is the end. I'll tell you what somebody said to me the other day, Joe. They said, the, the, why do you always, when you walk on and you sit down, you fold your hands like that across <laughs> your... Like that. Well... Is that a defensive <laughs> posture? Well, uh, not down that low, Michael, but uh, I, I think probably you hit with a cricket ball at some stage <laughs> or other. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, it, 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 quite seriously, I, a defensive posture, when, when a person were, were to stand up, you see them at funerals or in the elevator, they, they do it. It's a, a non-person posture and it's, you know, I'm glad to be here, but uh, they're really not. So I, I think there could be one of those. I hope it was one of those. <laughs> but what about, what about now, while you're up, you, know, you also, you, you draw conclusions from people, don't you, by watching the, uh, I mean, the famous yes. people. Yes, uh, we've not, I mean, you do the, the, the Prince Philip thing you tell me about. Oh, yes, well, th th that is a particular pose, well, and it's not derogatory in any way, no. Michael, but sure, pr sure, pr pr Prince Philip, invariably you'll see him attending something, and his coat will be done up, then you'll find the, the thumb will be out what of What does the... that mean? Is that an aggressive? Oh, captain, a captain on the bridge, you know, yeah. I'm in charge. And if you have the both thumbs, and, and, you know, <laughs> it's you see the aggressive, dominant people, and you see them very often. This is no kidding, but uh, Prince Philip does that, and he is an aggressive, dominant person. That's not n necessarily nasty, and he walks. But when he walks, you'll notice it. He doesn't turn his shoulders. 
And that's an interesting gesture in itself. People who are interested uh, kind of turn their shoulders. He's probably inspecting the, the Zawili dancers or something, and he's probably wondering what he's going to have for dinner when he gets home. <laughs> and he would tend to walk like that. But the fact that the shoulders and the hips don't change, he would indicate to me that, you know, here's a person under an inspection, and he really is not particularly interested. He's being polite. But, you know, if something were to happen, you know, if someone was standing some broken glass at, and there'd be a big yelp, he'd turn around like that where the axis of the uh, hips and the shoulders would actually be towards the audience. Now, what part does, what part does eye contact play in, uh, in body language? I mean, how much can you, can yeah, you tell or a, not tell? It's very important, very basically. When people avoid your gaze, they, they tend to be fibbing. And once they learn that they've been fibbing, they'll tend to look at you and not move away from you like this. And they're also overcompensating. Normally, people look at you for between one-third and two-thirds of the time. But, you know, if we could ask the people, what do the girls, for instance, think of guys who've got those silvered glasses. You know those silvered mirror glasses? Yeah, I can see a couple of people saying, mm -hmm, yuck. See, if a person can't see your eyes, you can't negotiate with them. E.T. Hall, the uh, American who advises the American government on relationships with the Arabs, uh, he talks about the glasses worn by, say, Arafat and some of the Arabian leaders. You can't see their eyes. You can't relate. Girls particularly find that must relate to people's eyes. Well, They're better than guys at reading body language. That's, are they? Oh, Girls yes. are the most yeah. sensitive to it. All the research shows women are better than men at uh, observing body language. And they say, I, I like him or I don't like him. I don't know why, you know, I just can't tell you why. Now, the question that every man here wants me to ask you is, is, is about this, the, the male-female relationship. I mean, in that magic moment when your eyes meet across a crowded room and all that yeah, sort of thing. that does but, happen. But what can, can you actually pick out immediately from meeting a girl what her initial response is to you from a body language? Oh, sure, can sure. You? You, you could look around the audience there and look, there's, there's a girl up there, Michael. She's either, she's giving us some of the signs. Maybe we'll take someone out of the audience and see whether she she's addressing me or is, you. Well, now, which girl do you mean? What about... This is, not, we've not, this is not a plant at all, we've, and the girl doesn't know. No, the girl looking up into the camera, the girl in the, the pretty blue... Girl. That pretty girl, right. Ah. Let's say we get her down, we'll Shall see how we go. All right. Do right. <laughs> you, you mind coming down? You didn't know this was going to happen, did you? No. <laughs> you thought you had a nice quiet evening sitting there, didn't you? You coming? Come on. We're going to read your reactions. Are, are those two big fellas, do they belong to you? One's my husband and the other's your brother. You better get right, Joe. <laughs> right. right, where do you want her to sit? Right, why don't you sit down, right, right here? Right. Yes, yeah, sit up, sit up close, right up close here to me. That would be fine. Right, so. Well, we'll see what... You can cross one, cross one leg or the other. <laughs> see how you go. Come on. OK. That's not too bad, Michael. That's not too bad for a start. Now, freeze and don't move. What's your name? Fraser, Michelle. Michelle. OK, Michael, let's see how well we're going. I reckon there, Mike, that I'm getting um, six no's and one possible. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are the no's, then? What are the, what are, what are the negative Well, let's, let's, let's very quickly run through, because it is quite serious. This is what people do. In my case, um, I'm leaning closer to that side of the chair, and if you'll notice, she's almost falling off that end there, right? That's one no, right? I'm leaning forward, she's leaning back, that's two. My shoulders are turned, showing interest. Her shoulders are square, that's three. My hands are over and up, that's four. Her hands, might just use your... No, leave them as they were, and they're even shaking, <laughs> right? So there's one there, that's five. And the fact that... Now, the only good one I'm getting is that, log, that leg being crossed there. And normally, if a person was really uptight, would you cross your other leg over? That would be the normal standard reaction, and it would be as defensive as that. And that's a classic seven out of seven no. Now, if she was like that, and I was like this, you know, I've got no way, her husband's safe. On the other hand, <laughs> would, you turn around, would you turn around this way? Put, uh, oh, I like it. Cross oh. that other leg over, fine. If she was like that, and uh, like that, what do you reckon? Apart from I'm stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I think you've got a definite blank. <laughs> yeah. a definite blank. Absolutely but so it can be seen, and there are interesting things that guys do. They, the girls tend to, um, when they're preening, this is the social aspects, guys tend to straighten their ties, and, and the, the girls can read it, and they head off for the, for the washroom and say, is he gone yet? Mm. But do, uh, I mean, do, do you believe in, what was your name, love? Michelle. Michelle, Michelle yeah. do you believe in this body language thing? Yeah, you can tell a lot from people. Can you? By the way they do you do do, do you what do you relate to to people that do body messages? Uh, Speak freely. <laughs> I'm too embarrassed to. <laughs> <laughs> but you can, yeah, just things that they um, the way they move their hands and things. All right. They're looking at you. All right, then, Michelle. Back then to your. Thanks to your very much, Michelle. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Give her a hand.
Now, you teach businessmen, don't you? And, and, yes. And policemen also. First of all, policemen. I mean, what do you teach yeah. policemen? Yes, uh, in Perth, um, I have worked with the uh, West Australian Police Force. In, in interviewing techniques, it's rather important. If you realise that two-thirds of what you say, people can read, it's so important when you're questioning. There are two aspects of body language. One, reading what other people are saying, and the other one is going over well yourself. And I think in the police force, for instance, it's so important that they go over well, and it's also important that they can recognise what people are saying. For instance, the congruence of, of positioning between people, who comes through the door first, and where people sit at a boardroom table, whether a person's likely to buy or not. If a person is open, their hands are up and their head's up and they're pointing up. If they're negative, their hands go over, they close their hands and they point down. But there are a lot can be taught in just interviewing. And, and in your profession, interviewing is well, your livelihood. And it's, it's so important with police people mm. and business people. Well, that's where I spend most of my time. Well, you time. teach salesmen, don't you? Sales yeah. techniques. Now, yeah. now, how do you re relate that? I mean, you teach guys who are on the knock, do you, on the door? <laughs> yes. Well, OK, let's take a door-to-door. -door. Most of my work is done with professional people selling computers or cars or whatever it may be. But on a door-to-door -door salesman, the, the, the nervous guy... And can I demonstrate? Please do. Look, the, the nervous guy tends to adopt this sort of a pose. He does his coat up, which is the first defensive, right? And then he puts a clipboard in front there, if I had one. That's the second defensive move. Then his hand goes out. That's the third defensive one. Then he has his dark sunnies on. And that's another defence. I, I would recommend any of the people who've got dark sunnies when they're doing business, leave them in the car. It is that bad, body language-wise. People don't relate. Then he'll go up and he'll, and he'll press the doorbell and then he'll kind of stand back. Now, he doesn't expect to get in. And the thing to do, even if you even a social call, you go there and you press the doorbell, put your hand down, unbutton the coat, open the door and you stand there. And if it happens to be a quite a nice young lady, you just look forward, you put your hand and say, hi there, how are you? And you do this with your feet and you walk straight in there. <laughs> 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 but what about what about situations? What about social situations? Say with one's wife. I mean, can you, if you understand body language, can you cheat on it? Yes, you can. Oh, you can. Let me g give you a, a, an interesting analogy. You can cheat on it, but I think because it's empathy, you've got to be very, very careful with your cheating. But certainly, you can. But let's assume you were to come home late um, from one of your parties, assuming you go to parties. What do you normally do as a guy with your wife? You'll think, gee, I'm home late, I, I must carefully drive. And you drive into the drive very quietly, and you turn off the lights, and you get into the garage, and you click the door open, you go up the path, and you open the door, and you feel your way around the dark. And the moment you get in there, your wife hears you, and you said, is that you, Michael? Are you back? And immediately you go on the defensive. But with body language, if you were to take the aggressive pose, and let's assume you come down the hill and you keep changing gears so everyone in the neighbourhood can hear, and you do a wheelie into the drive, right, lean on the horn, slam all four doors, then she thinks four people are coming in, right? And then you go up the path and you start disrobing, turn on all the lights in the house, and, and you announce in a very loud voice, Honey, lover boy's arrived, move over, and she'll pretend she's asleep. <laughs> You don't know my wife, or do you? Um, <laughs> anyway, Joe, thank you very much for talking to me. Um, doing my job and certainly living with my wife will not be the same after having met you, <laughs> Dr. Joe Brace. Right. Thank you very much indeed. My next guest once described himself as a pub pianist made good, which is a fair description of someone who started his professional life playing requests for members of the local bowling club in Tenterfield, northern New South Wales, and who at present performs a one-man show which has been a sellout on Broadway in LA and here in Sydney and Melbourne. Describing his show, American critics strained several ligaments in searching for a proper description of his talents. He was likened to Noel Coward, Jerry Lee Lewis, Elton John, and even Truman Capote. The fact is it, that he is himself highly original, a one-off. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Peter Allen. How is your body language? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that's, that's I didn't right. mean to that's say that. Right. To that's you. Yeah, you too. Sorry. I said in the intro that you started off as a, as a pub pianist. You said that to somebody in England. It conjures up pictures of lovely sort of oak bean pubs and that sort of thing. Was that the same pubs that you you played in? I, I guess they were pretty nice. Yeah, they were old Australian pubs, and I think old Australian pubs are really beautiful. Mm -hmm. And what sort of, of act did you do there? Was it a request type? Well, I was, I was, it was before, my, I was before an act. I was just being myself then. Because mm -hmm. I was only nine, it wasn't hard. <laughs> you, <know. laughs> you, you did, of course, move from being a, a pub uh, pianist to your first sort of professional act was uh, as 
The Allen Brothers, wasn't it? Well, I was still being a pub pianist. What happened was, um, when I, I used to play in the pubs on Saturday nights and things and um, take requests, which is where I learned so many old songs. Then I went to, uh, so I read, read in the paper that Surface Paradise needed acts badly. So I uh, took what money I had out of the bank and uh, took a bus to Surface Paradise. Obviously, I didn't need acts quite that badly because I didn't get a job. <laughs> But uh, I figure I, playing in pubs seemed to me uh, a little bit easier than getting a regular job. Mm. So I, I was sitting around um, playing in pubs and um, Chris Allen had another act at that point and he had a booking to get on bandstand in Sydney and um, his other partner decided he'd rather go and cut sugar cane than continue in, in, in show business. A wise decision, I thought at the time, yeah. <laughs> and uh, they needed a partner, so... But how, how crucial well, Bandstand was, of course, quite crucial to, to your career, but it was crucial to, to the careers of several other people, too, wasn't it? Because it was quite a stable. There was a, there was a whole family. At that point, it was um, the beginning of Australian rock and roll. And uh, in those days, you really had to work every place. You couldn't just... If you were on Bandstand, you had to do Bandstand. Plus, you had to do Pantos. You had to work in the workers' clubs. You had to really appeal to a pretty wide variety of people, only because that was the only way to make a living. You couldn't just be a rock and roller or and appeal to teenagers. You really, you, to earn money, you had to really appeal to everyone. Mm -hmm. So I think what happened was that whole first family that used to work six o'clock rock and bandstand got used to working pretty hard and under all different kind of circumstances. And um, I think that's why Helen Reddy, Olivia, and uh, a lot of other acts were able to survive just because they were used to working hard where a lot of other people might have given up. I mean, in that period too, I mean, you played pantomime as well, didn't you? I was in the pandas, yes. Yeah. What was that like? It was ve very weird because Chris, uh, you didn't ever see Chris and I. No, did no I didn't. Oh, it was, it's a pity, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a lovely, yeah, it was a good act, wasn't it? Is there anyone old enough to remember Chris and Peter Allen? Yeah. <laughs> and do you remember us? And yeah. It was nice, wasn't it? We were good, yeah. We were great, see? That man said we were great. <laughs> but we didn't look too much alike. Well, we weren't even brothers. No. I don't know how we turned out to be brothers, but. They cast us um, in Alice in Wonderland as Tweedledee and Tweedledum. And they were supposed to be twins, identical twins. You know. There were Chris and I, you know, standing up there. And I don't know, well, there's a bit of an awful thing happened because we were doing a show at 10 in the morning and 3 in the morning, th and 3 in the afternoon. And as Tweedledum and Tweedledee, we had to wear these uh, leotards. And Chris and I in leotards. Well, we didn't know anything about what you're supposed to wear under leotards. <laughs> Nor do I. <laughs> well, you're supposed to wear something under leotards, oh, I see, I see. you know. <laughs> and Mary Hardy was in it, and Patsy Ann Noble and Jill Perryman. It was a, a, kind of a good cast. And we couldn't figure out, every time we'd come on, mothers were putting their eyes up. The, little, <laughs> you know, the children's eyes, putting their hands over their eyes. Until Mary Hardy finally broke down and said, you look like you've got packets of Jaffas down your pad. Please put on jock straps, you know. It's amazing where you learn the facts of life. It is, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> now, can I talk to you about, about the, uh, the um, impact that one of my very favourite performers, Judy Garland, had on your career? Because she did have a, a, quite a profound effect in more ways than one, didn't she? When did you first meet her, Peter? Yeah, I guess we first met her in, I guess. I mean, it was in Hong Kong in 1964. Mm. And she had just been to Australia, and she was recovering from being in Australia in Hong Kong. It hadn't, no, it hadn't been a very successful trip. Uh, but that was hardly Australia's fault, was it? Um, it was no, but a, a lot of it was the press at that time. I think really? they were, yeah, they were pretty. The pre Australian press at that time were fairly intense, and uh, I, I think it really gave her a shock, and she didn't, um, she didn't fare very well. I think, I think she fared very well in certain places, but uh, there was a bad concert in Melbourne and that kind of took, took over. Bad because sort of, a, of a health of the well, time? Well, she didn't do a very good show. She was an hour, hour late and stuff like that. And um, they weren't used to, in America they used to, you know, you go, let's go to Judy Carlin concert, oh, we have another probably, uh, she'll be about three hours late tonight, let's have another drink and, you know, have dessert. You know? <laughs> but in Australia they all turned up at 7.30 waiting to see Judy, you know. <laughs> kind of, she got on in a bad state at about 8.30 and that was, and the press were, got, were a little hard on her. Mm -hmm. But uh, that happened every place, you know. And we were the opening act. We used to go out there merrily and sing our opening songs and everything, and then a doctor would come out and say, I'm afraid, Miss Garland, tonight will be, you know. And they'd say, well, let's get the money out of those two that started it, you know. They'd attack us really? and tear us to pieces. Mm -hmm. you know? 
What was her What was her state of health at that time, though, uh, uh, Peter? I mean, was she She was on the way out, wasn't she? Oh, I don't know. It was in between comebacks. I mean, she, there were so many comebacks towards the end, and she was always fine at the comebacks. Um, <coughs> she wasn't well. She was having an operation in Hong Kong, and uh, her traveling companion came to see us and visited her the next day and said, gee, I saw this fabulous act last night at the Hilton. And she kind of said, what were you doing at the Hilton? She had things in her throat, and what were you doing at the Hilton? He said, oh, I was seeing this act, it was so good. She said, really? And he said, yes. He said, oh, well, let me get out all this stuff. And she pulled all the stuff out, put a scarf on and a hat on and came to the show that night. Extraordinary. So it sounds more, it sounds like more fun than lying here. Yeah. What do you, what do you think of her as a person? Well, my thing was that I didn't really know too much about her. I mean, I'd seen her in movies and things, but I didn't really listen to Judy Garland records because I was, you know, 18 years old, 19, and I was listening to rock and roll and stuff like that. I wasn't listening to um, Over the Rainbow. So when she came I, to the show, I thought, oh, that's nice. Yes, I remember her from movies and things, but I didn't think of her as a, a huge star. I didn't know too much about the concerts and things. So we just became friends. And when I first saw the first concert, it was at the Palladium in London, uh, about in 65, I think. She did some midnight concerts there. And I came to the concert, I said, look at all these people, isn't it nice that they've turned up for my friend Judy to see Judy at midnight? I thought, isn't this nice that they all came? And of course, then I saw her work and I thought, oh my God, look at what she's doing. But up until then, so it was hard for me to think of her as um, a superstar because I'd been a friend first. Mm. Mm. Of course, she was more than a friend. She became your mother-in-law, didn't oh, yes, she? Yes, did yeah. too. I forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> Until now. <laughs> but I mean, that, that must have been extraordinary for you, not being married to Miss Minnelli, but but just the fact of, of it must have pitchforked you into a different kind of society. Well, it did, but I didn't know it was that different. You see, because yeah. coming from Australia, I mean, I'd really grown up in a very small town, and. I didn't know who all these people were, so I wasn't phased by them at all. I mean, she said, I said, where are we going to tonight? She'd say, we're off to Noel Cowards. And I'd think, oh, no. God, <laughs> oh. Then she'd say, oh, now we're off to David and Evans, and we're off out with Margot Fontaine and Rudolph Neri and the Beatles. And I kept saying, who are all these people you keep dragging us off to see? You know, I'd just like to go to sleep. I'm so tired. And so now that I look back, I think, how could I have slept through all those parties and dinners. I did, I would fall meet. I'd, I used to fall asleep on the table. Really? And she'd wake me up to meet Cary Grant. I'd say, hello, I'm sorry. <laughs> she'd say, he's great talent. And I'd say, she's right, and then go back to sleep. <laughs> she enjoyed that socialising, did she? Well, she would just have done it all her life. Yes, yes. Did she ever get uh, rebuffed herself because of her enthusiasm for, for stars? Did she get rebuffed? Rebuffed. I remember you told me a story about Bette Davis once with her. Oh, no, that was, uh, that was Liza. I was, sorry. Yes, that was Liza. Um, no, Liza, I, see, I wasn't impressed by the stars mainly because I didn't know who they were. And it was strange because Liza was very impressed by them, even though they'd always say, oh, oh, oh Liza, I haven't seen you since I bounced, you know, Jimmy Stewart would say, oh, I used to bounce you on my name. She'd say, oh, Jimmy Stewart said he used to bounce me on my name. Well, he, I said, he probably did, you know. He <laughs> and she said, oh, isn't that wonderful? And I said, I guess it is, you know. I wasn't quite sure who Jimmy Stewart was except from Cowboy movies. <laughs> so I wasn't all that impressed. Liza was incredibly impressed. Of course, now I can barely open my mouth to Olivia, you know. It's like, hello. <laughs> I'm really impressed now, but I wasn't there. Mm. And what was the Davis thing? I was, uh, Betty Davis, I think it's a stock answer because I've heard it a few times. If you, if you go up and say to Betty Davis, hello, like Liza went up and said, hello, I'm Miss Davis, I'm Liza Minnelli. And Betty always just looks around and goes, of course you are, and then just turns back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> terrible. God. She's done it to a lot of people, I think. <laughs> right. Now, you, in fact, your career as a songwriter took off, did it not, when you split with, uh, with Miss Minnelli? Well, I split with Miss Minnelli and... Um, we both sound like Tiny yes. Sid Owens, great. I split with uh, Liza and um, Chris, and I, I just decided I didn't want to you know, spend my waning years in a tuxedo singing The Impossible Dream. <laughs> so, uh, see, it had never occurred to me that I was... Uh, this, since I'd been doing this since I was 14, it never occurred to me that I was younger than the Beatles, you know. Mm. And all of a sudden I thought, I started to hear music that I liked, and I thought, well, maybe I could do that instead of really being buried, like, in the Las Vegas graveyard at that point. Mm. What was the song that you wrote that sort of set you, set you off on the road? 
Well, I wrote a few, successful. but I guess the first successful one was I Honestly Love You because um, it was kind of an accident. I wrote it and uh, someone played it for Olivia in London and she didn't know that I'd written it and I didn't know she'd recorded it. And uh, I went off for the summer to live in the woods or something I was at that point. And I came back one day and I said, whatever happened to that song of Olivia's? They said, well, she put it out as a single. And I said, oh, the poor thing. God, must have killed her career. They said, it's number one. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. You also uh, did you not at one time when you were on the way up with somebody I've interviewed recently in London, the outrageous Miss Bette Midler. Oh, did you like her? Oh, I adored her. Yeah, I she's, she's extraordinary. And yeah. talk about body language working there. That's oh. unbelievable. <laughs> I mean, it's that's a lot to work with. A lot to work with. <laughs> <That's right>. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> It pops out all over, doesn't it? Doesn't it? But I mean, but, but was she always that outrageous? Because I wanted to ask you that. Well, when, when, I, when I started to, uh, to write songs, there was only a couple of places where you could go because the, there were not really any places set up. Cabarets hadn't re-emerged in New York. And so there's a place called Improvisation, which is still there, where people can go and try out material. So I used to go there and sing. And um, there was this crazy girl came in one night and she started to bang the tables. And I thought, oh, listen to this girl, isn't she? Listen to this. And I mean, she came over and was banging my table. And I said, please stop this. I'm the next act. And you're making me so nervous. And she said, oh, sorry. And went on to bang someone else's table while she was singing, you know. And then she started singing at the Continental Baths and she made it a place to be. And then I went and sang. And then we both decided we'd, we'd team up. So we off we went to Los Angeles together to. Uh, and I was the opening act for her in Los Angeles and her first time there. And Barry Manilow was her pianist, and Melissa right. Manchester was one of the harlots. Yeah, right. Mm. Now, you broke away from this being this sort of sensitive songwriter image by cavorting and talking about prancing around on stage and even stripping as well, quite an outrageous sort of element you introduced into your act. How did you start that? Why? Well, when I, when I stopped being an Allen brother and I decided I wanted nothing to do with all that showbiz stuff, I thought I'd just be the sensitive singer-songwriter. Well, I was the sensitive singer-songwriter, and I was even boring myself. I was so sensitive, and I could see the audience falling asleep. And meanwhile, everyone else had been sick of being sensitive songwriters, so they were getting up and dancing and all that. And I would go and see them, I'd think, these people are not very good at this, you know? And then I thought, you, you've been doing it since you were 14, and it's the one thing you know how to do is to get up and be stupid on stage, so why not be a little bit stupid along with the sensitive ballads? So I'd do one sensitive ballad, and then I'd get up and be stupid for a, one, one other song, and people just couldn't figure out whether they were supposed to, I was supposed to be sensitive or whether I was supposed to take off my clothes and be stupid. So then I thought, well, that's kind of a good act. Never care, always keep them not knowing quite whether, what's going on, going on. And it went to that kind of a balance, and I think it's still that, because uh, I like to keep an audience not quite knowing what, what I'm going to do next. Well, I think that's just fairly true. I think unpredictable is something that could be said about you on, on, on stage. But, but let's briefly talk about the way you write songs. Um, I mean, what's the inspiration? I mean, you wrote a song called I Go To Rio, mm -hmm. right, which is a big hit. Yeah. Did, uh, was that inspired by being in Rio? No, I'd never been there. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what I wondered. No, Did you, you know, it was, it was so weird because I had this melody and I was introduced to a girl, Adrienne Anderson, who also writes with Barry Manilow. It's very incestuous, all the people who write together. You know, you write with everyone, writes with everyone. And I had this melody, and, she's, and normally I would have put a very complex, you know, I'd love to love you if I could leave my wife, but I'm uh, um, involved with someone. And she said, you can't write another one to that happy melody. All, my, all your songs are like that. Why don't you write, when my baby smiles at me, I go to... And I said, where? You know. So we kind of went, heaven. I was like, no, not heaven. And we, we couldn't think of any place to go. And all of a sudden, I said, just Rio. She said, Rio. And I said, De Janeiro. I said, look, at rhymes. Let's not be, we haven't found any place else to go. We have a rhyme. And maybe someone will hear it and invite us there. <laughs> so that's how we wrote, I got a Rio. Yeah, so much for inspiration settling on your shoulder. Oh, yeah. yeah. Did you ever actually go there in the end? Well, yes, I, they became a big hit. It's like White Christmas down there. <laughs> yes, every time they drag out, I go to Rio, and off I go again. How basically, though, did you come to the idea for a song? I mean, what is, do you have a working pattern, or did just a phrase come in your mind, and then you... Yeah. Well, it's funny, like, I've been writing, for some strange reason, the last few songs I've written um, have been all snapped up by black girls. I think it's a bit odd. I'm writing with this guy who's from Detroit, but Polish. So, I mean, there's this Australian and this Polish boy from Detroit, and everything we write, we have black girls fighting for. I mean, Dionne Warwick is 
trying to beat up pedal. I must have that song, you know. So all of a sudden, I'm the new soul writer. God knows how I write at this. <laughs> and we started writing, and he said, well, let's write a song about when you go to the supermarket and you hear that noise that goes ding, 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 the supermarket. Well, I was looking at him and thinking, this is not going to be a very successful collaboration at all. <laughs> he said, you know that sound? Go ding, 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 ding at the supermarket. And I said, look, I have to, I'm sorry, but I don't go shopping. I'm sorry. And he said, you're right, that's a much better title. And I said, what? I don't go shopping. I said, oh. <laughs> so I said, I don't go shopping for love. And he said, yes, I don't go shopping for love. So we write, I don't go shopping for love for about five minutes, and it's a huge hit now, if you can believe that. That's amazing, isn't it? For Patti LaBelle, yeah. Uh, now, what about the song you're going to uh, do now? Um, this one's called I Still Call Australia Home, which, I, I mean, I figured that everyone always writes a song about, I mean, I left my heart in San Francisco, yeah. and you can, as long as you mention an American city, Australians like it, and I thought, there hasn't really been one about, except Sydney, my Sydney, that the other channel uses at the end of the night, you know. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> it's funny, Australians are a little bit weird about when you use Australia in a song, I found. And I just wanted to write one that was like one of those really big sentimental, I left my heart in San Francisco, but just mean it about Australia. Because mm -hmm. it's the way I feel when I come back. You do. I think a lot of people are feeling that way, yeah. Mm -hmm. You feel very Australian still, do you, in spite yeah. of the fact of... In spite of the fact of what? Of being, of, of working and, and oh. living. <laughs> <laughs> sure, yeah. <laughs> All right, then, sir. Your piano, Mr. Tommy right. Tico, waits you over there. Oh, they're good, aren't they, too? Oh, Tommy's marvelous. good, yes, isn't he? So let's be down then singing a song he wrote called I Still Call Australia Home. Miss Vida. <laughs>
Right. My thanks to Mr. Peter Allen. Now, my final guest tonight is one of Australia's best-known humanists and personalities, one who commands a deep respect with both Aboriginal and white people. Her father was a slave, and from that background, she's carried on an eventful career trying to foster better relationships and understanding between white and black Australians. Her instruments of persuasion have been political through her association with such organisations as the Women's Electoral Lobby and various bodies concerned with the fate of Australian black people. Moreover, she's reached a wider audience as a campaigner, speaker and a writer. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Faith Bandler. <laughs> about your hands, are you? Well, should it be? Uh, whichever way, I don't, I don't mind, Faith. Either way, it's very pleasant. I've never I really don't know what to do with my hands I after death. It does freak you out rather, doesn't it? You want to sit on them, rather, don't bother, yes. just relax. I must say, I've never ever, actually, in all the years I've been interviewing, I've never interviewed anybody whose father was a slave. In what circumstances was your father a slave? Well, uh, my father, Michael, was a slave in Queensland. Uh, on the sugar in the sugarcane industry. Now, he was brought from the uh, New Hebride Islands in 1883 as a boy of about 12. And the sugarcane industry of this country was in fact developed on slave labor. The uh, South Pacific was raided very heavily by uh, slaving vessels. The whole idea originated with, uh, by a man uh, by the name of um, Towns, Robert Towns, and uh, he was a great Christian. But he also had a lot of money and he bought a lot of vessels and he sent the vessels into the Pacific to raid the islands and uh, bring the islanders into the ports of Queensland to uh, work the cane fields. What sort of, um, what sort of um, uh, a man was your father? I mean... Oh, uh, it was lovely. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, but, but it must have scarred him mentally, uh, being a slave, his attitude toward white people, did it? Well, I, I don't think so. I really don't think so. He was uh, a very, um, a very strong person, physically. Uh, six foot plus, uh, beautiful uh, and black and as straight as a telephone pole. No, he wasn't scarred. You know, he told us the stories of um, his childhood and how he was taken from his village and brought to Queensland as a very young boy, as I told you. And uh, these were the stories that he told us at night. You know, uh, there were eight of us and we didn't get any uh, stories about Alice in Wonderland or uh, um, Cinderella. The stories we got were the stories of my father's childhood. And I suppose that shaped you politically and emotionally and, and every other way, uh, bound to have, inevitably so. What kind of, one of eight children you were, uh, born with a slave father, what, was it very poverty stricken, your background? No, I wouldn't say that. Um, I was born on the north coast of New South Wales and we were, um, my father after escaping from the uh, plantation that he, he was enslaved on, then came south to New South Wales and um, he started a banana farm. Now the people who lived around us, our neighbours were uh, Irish, mainly Irish people. Uh, they had dairy, dairy farming was carried on there. And um, we grew up with the Irish children. Uh, we went to school with them, we played with them. And the, um, their mothers visited my mother and um, for afternoon tea, as was the habit then, you know, Sunday afternoon. So, so no racial discrimination there? No. What did that no. teach you, though, about racial discrimination? Well, I didn't experience uh, racial discrimination until I went to school. 
And unfortunately, I didn't go to school with the Irish kids. They went to the Catholic schools, uh, the Catholic school, and I went to school uh, at the public school um, with the Protestants. And uh, they didn't appear to be as tolerant as the Irish kids did. So when they called me names, of course, uh, the Irish kids would um, get hold of them after school. You've been bashing up. You know, I say, <laughs> I, I, I say to the kids today, the Italian kids and the Greek kids and so forth, you know, here they're called um, dagos and wogs and what have you. I said, you know, after school, you get hold of them, get stuck into them. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the answer, isn't it, to fight back well, things? Sure, yeah. sure. Yeah. When did you get involved in the black movement, Faith? Uh, well, you know, look, I really don't know, Michael, because when you're black, there isn't a beginning of involvement in black affairs. Somehow or other, it's always there. Hmm. I think so, anyhow. But what was the situation? I mean, what was it, what was it like growing up as a, as a young black woman in Australia? Well, it's awfully hard to be black in Australia. And it's harder still, of course, if you're a woman. Um, I think that uh, because, I'm sure it was because of uh, my father's influence, I was able to grow up um, being well equipped, as it were, to deal with the Knox. I think so. You mean hardened? I think so. Philosophical. I think so, yes. Well, then let's, all right, if you can't pinpoint your, your uh, first involvement with the black movement, let's then talk about how, in fact, you became a, a prime mover in the, what, the 67 referendum, wasn't it, against the uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, What was the state of the black people in Australia before that referendum in 67? Well, it was, um, it was very bad. You see, um, There were six laws under which the Aboriginal people had to live. Unlike all other Australians, every state had a separate law. Now, you know, an Aboriginal person had to be a bit of a bush lawyer to be able to move from one state to another because he or she didn't know what the laws were. Uh, if you were in Victoria, it wasn't quite so bad. If you came into New South Wales, it was a little worse. But heaven help you if you went into the deep north. So, um, I think it was around about 1957 uh, when it was suggested that something ought to be done to bring the Aboriginal people under a Commonwealth law. And uh, so, the result of that was the referendum ten years later. We took that petition out into churches and the trade unions Trade unionists took it around. What was the breakthrough for you, though, Faith? I mean, it was, was it the meeting you had with, with Menzies in Canberra, wasn't it? Oh, yes, that's... Well, I think so, yes, I think so. Well, what was it? What happened? Well, we'd been peddling the petition and taking it around and asking people to sign it. We had to get 100,000 signatures, and that was quite a lot. And uh, on one occasion, um, the vice president, by then we'd formed a national organization mm. and we had a federal member of parliament mm. who became our senior vice president and he called one day by phone and it was very handy having him because he could ring around to all the states. Mm. And uh, he said, look, um, the prime minister is happy about meeting you, so I think you better come up and talk to him about mm. this, um, about the need for the referendum. So um, we got together in Canberra, and our executive came from different states, and we assembled in Canberra, and we sat around the um, cabinet table, and we told him the great need to have the state laws abolished, or rather that the Commonwealth should have power to overrule the states, and uh, that it ought to be able to legislate for the benefit of the Aboriginal people. and. I don't think he'd actually met with any Aboriginal person before, except perhaps for, um, for Doug Nichols, who's a very famous person yeah, in, yeah. in Victoria. And uh, so there, you know, he was sitting with us. And I think he thought, well, you know, why shouldn't these people 
have the benefit of the laws which govern all other people. I'm sure of this. Anyhow, we had this discussion. We all told him why we wanted the referendum, and uh, after it was all over, he took us for a, a drink in his kitchen, I think. I don't know what it was, something at the back. And I could always remember, and I have told this story before, but I'll tell you. Uh, he took us into the kitchen for a drink, and he, he given me a drink and he turned to Kath Walker, who is a very famous Aboriginal poet. And he said to Kath, um, what will you have? And uh, Kath said, Mr. Prime Minister, if you give me a drink, where I come from, Queensland, you'll be put in jail. And you could see the look of distress that came over his face. And I really believe that that was the turning point. Mm. Are things, uh, generally speaking, though, Faith, are they any better now? Oh, well, yes, of course they are, because um, it was very, very serious for the Aboriginal people prior to 1967. And uh, as many anthropologists said, all that could be done was to ease the dying pillow. And it was true. Now, um, since then, of course, uh, the Commonwealth has allocated uh, funds for medical aid and legal aid, uh, education and housing, but it's not nearly good enough. It's not? No, of but course I mean, not. I mean, but do, but do, do Australians, mm. generally speaking, in your experience, do they care about the Aboriginal problem? I, I don't think so, no. I, well, they can't. They couldn't possibly care about the... Uh, Aboriginal problem because if that was so, the Aboriginal people today would not be at the very bottom of the economic ladder as they are. Um, I think that um, we have a long way to go before we can say that the Indigenous Australians are equal with others. How much of a personal problem have you had through marrying a white man? Have you had any? Any reaction among your black friends? Oh, I haven't had any reaction from my black friends, but I've had a bit of reaction from my white friends. Have you? I should always remember, you know, Hans and, Hans and I were getting around a bit together. And this is a long way, a long time ago, you know, it's about 28 years, 29 years now. And I had a very, very dear friend who was awfully kind to me and uh, we had uh, many good times together, an elderly, elderly woman. And uh, she often took me out to lunch or perhaps we'd go to a concert or so. And on one occasion I went up to see her for an evening for a meal. And I said, Margaret, do you know what? And she said, no what? I said, well, Hans and I are going to get married. She was quite distressed, and she said, My girl, have you thought of the children? And I said, No, Margaret, I think there are enough of you lot thinking about the children. Why should I have to worry about them? <laughs> Can I finally ask you that when you look at the future of the black person in, uh, in Australia, are you filled with hope or are you filled with despair? Despair. Are you? Mm. Things are going to get worse, you think? Yes, I do. For this reason, I think the burning issue for the Aboriginal people um, is the right to own land. Now, I don't know how the, um, the black people who are working up in Canberra uh, feel about this, but I say to them, you know, it's no use them sucking up to, uh, to a government that has a policy for mining. Uh, because if mining is going ahead, then there's not going to be any land rights and uh, there's not going to be any respect for the sacred lands. So uh, I have very little hope there that anything will uh, develop for the Aboriginal people. And then again, uh, Michael, I think that we ought to remember that um, Certainly, we have a very high rate of unemployment in this country, uh, but 80% of employable Aboriginal people today are unemployed. 
Yeah, that's very high. Uh, there are 10% um, of the prison population in this country are of Aboriginal descent. And bearing in mind that the Aboriginal people still only make up 1% of the overall population. So all they can hope for in the future is uh, that you make that pillow you talked of more comfortable rather than make the solution. Oh, well, I, I hope not, but I can't see uh, very much else developing. There's ill health, there's bad housing. Um, large percentage of the people of 50 and 60 will be blind for the rest of their lives through neglect. Um, well. Faith Bounder, thank you very much indeed. Okay. <laughs> That's it then for this evening. My thanks to uh, Dr. Joe Bracish, to Peter Allen, and to Faith Band. We'll be about the same time next week from all of us here. Until then, a very good night. Good night.